Hello again. Uh, in this uh, tutorial, we are going to go through uh, the procedure of defining a project in Frame Modeler 2D uh, for uh, steel building with moment resisting frame. So, this video will be similar to the one that we uh, discussed for concentrically braced frames, uh, but for moment resisting frames and uh, we will be trying actually to conduct uh, incremental dynamic analysis. So let's look, take a look at the example building that we are going to model. So quickly, this is the building that we are trying to model. Again, it has a rectangular plan view. Uh, the dimensions are 140 feet by 100 feet. Uh, in the east-west direction, which is the direction actually that we are going to consider for analysis. So we are looking in the east-west direction. Uh, if we look at the elevation in the east-west direction, we can see here the heights of the floors. So this is a four-story building. We can see the bay width. We can see here the moment-resisting frame in red. So this is our main frame, the lateral load-resisting system. And uh, in black, we have here the uh, some of the gravity beams and the gravity columns in the elevation. So this is what we are trying to model uh, today in Frame Modeler and conduct incremental uh, dynamic analysis for it. So let's see uh, how we can proceed. So the first thing is to open uh, Frame Modeler 2D, FM2D, and you can do this from the I do this from the shortcut, I have it here on the desktop, and as we mentioned, make sure that you run it as an administrator. So now the program is being uh, is initializing, again I will put here the uh, command window here, uh, the shell window to the right. So you may give it like few seconds to open. So now the console has been uh, launched. So again, I will put it uh, here to the right. So now we can go ahead and start. Uh, again, I will not go into things here in detail. I will just try to model uh, the building that we are discussing today. But I went uh, through some details in the CBF example you can check this video uh, or you can also refer to uh, other videos uh, related to the functionalities in frame modeler or to the uh, technical manual so I will go ahead and start a new project so I'm being asked where to save this project so I will save it at the desktop uh, I will call it uh, CB, uh, MRF building example and click enter then I've been prompt to select the type of bilateral load resisting system my main frame so in our case we are having a moment resisting frame MRF so I select that for the units I'll be using kip and inches I will not provide a description, but you can do that, of course, this is optional. So then I will click Submit. So once I do that, now, as we see here, I have right now on the desktop the, the MATLAB data file, the .mat file for my project. So it has been saved over here. And right now I have the first uh, button has been activated in my console. So this is the first thing that we need to define in my model, which is the model parameters. So I will go ahead and click on model parameters. And over here, we'll start defining the basic uh, numerical modeling options. So for geometric transformation, I will be using P delta transformation because we are doing incremental dynamic analysis and of course P delta is important and must be considered in order to trigger collapse. So I will be choosing P delta. The numerical model, model type, of course, it has to be nonlinear because again, this is incremental dynamic analysis. 
Uh, for the modeling consideration, I will be considering the panel zone uh, deformation, meaning that I will be considering the uh, flexibility of the column web panel zone region. If you click here on the uh, uh, help or the tip uh, button to the next to it, you can see here what does this mean. So it will show you a tip window that tells you that this means that you are going to consider the column panel zone deformation using the idealized parallelogram model and a tri trilinear hysteretic uh, uh, deterioration model for its shear force, shear distortion behavior. And here you have the references that you can uh, refer to to read more about this. Uh, in the same time, you have this uh, illustration here that shows you what does this mean pretty much when we consider the panel zone deformation. So this is how the panel zone will be idealized. So you have here on the top right corner, you will have a rotational spring that will capture this deformation flexibility. If we don't consider the panel zone deformation, then it will be idealized like this without any rotational spring, meaning that, of course, that you will not capture this uh, deformation flexibility. So that's fine. Uh, the second thing is that I would consider rigid floor diaphragm, meaning that all the points at a given floor level will move uh, equally uh, in the lateral direction, the horizontal direction, so they will displace equally. So I'm assuming this because I'm assuming that I have a floor slab that's connecting all those nodes together. So this is my assumption. Uh, the other two assumptions is the gravity framing system and the composite action, whether we are going to consider it, consider the contributions of the gravity framing system. Again, uh, in our building, you have the main frame and you have uh, the rest of the building, which consists of the gravity framing system, gravity beams connected to gravity columns, and those have some strength and stiffness that will contribute to the uh, rigidity uh, and the response of your uh, building, of course. So you are being asked, should you consider it or not? Uh, I did already consider that in the CBF uh, tutorial, so I will not consider it here, just to simplify things. Again, you are asked if you want to consider the effect of the composite action that's being provided by the floor slab. Uh, so again, there are references that you can refer to about what does this mean, uh, how is it being considered. So again, I discussed this in the CBF tutorial. Uh, I will not do this in uh, today. Uh, and I will not actually co consider the composite action just again to keep things simple. So I will not consider those two. Uh, for the second tab, which is files and folders. So if you click on that again, uh, this is pretty much the results folder path. So you need to browse for the location uh, where you would like to save uh, the output, the analysis output, where do you want to save it. So right now, by default, it's already situated in the same location as the pro our project file. So it's uh, saved over here in the desktop. So I will keep it as it is, actually. The second thing is you can specify the name of the OpenSeas file that will be generated for your model. Again, automatically, it's been taken the same as the uh, our project name, but without after removing the spaces in the name. And it has, of course, the .tcl extension. So I will leave this as it is. So now that's it. We're done with the modeling option. So I will go ahead and click Submit. Now this is done. Now it says here it turns green, this button, and it's telling me that you are using a nonlinear, and you have dash, and then it says B. So B refers that our model is a bare steel model. What does bare steel model mean? Meaning that you are not considering the composite action. You are not considering the gravity framing system. So that's why it says B over here. If you check the CBF, a tutorial video, you will see that 
uh, when we consider the composite action and we consider the gravity framing system contributions, uh, the abbreviation here was saying uh, CG, so C for composite action and G for gravity framing. But since again, we didn't consider any of those here, so it just says B, meaning bare steel uh, frame. So the second thing that we need to define uh, would be the building parameters. So I will go ahead and open the building parameters module. So if I click on it, so now we're getting uh, this module over here that has four tabs with some information that we need to define regarding our building. Uh, so the first tab is the building geometry. And here uh, you need to specify the building geometry using the units of inches, the same as what we have uh, selected for the project units. So the first thing is the building plan dimensions. And if I open uh, my building again, so my building is 140 feet by 100 feet. So you need to put these values in uh, inches. So that would give me these two values, uh, 1680 inches by It. Uh, direction 1 and direction 2 so this refers to the direction 1 refers to the considered direction which is the east-west direction in our case and direction 2 refers to the uh, orthogonal direction uh, then uh, we need to specify the tributary area for the exterior column this is the main frame column so what is the tributary area associated with the column so again if I open my example, so this is the exterior column, so this is the one over here. See, the tributary area will be pretty much this area that's tributary to this column. So in this case, if maybe I, if I look here in this uh, uh, view, I can see that this is 20 feet on the right, I get 20 feet from the right and I get 10 feet from the left, so that's 30 feet. And in this direction, this is 20 feet, so this is half of it is 10. So the tributary area for the exterior column is 30 feet by 10 feet. So I need to put this in inches. So 30 feet, that would be 360, and 10 feet would be 120 inches. For the interior column, the same thing. If I look at the interior column, the interior column over here will be taking 10 feet, which is half of the bay width from the right and half from the left. So that's 10 plus 10, that's 20. So 20 feet and in the other direction, it still remains 10 feet. So that will give me 20 by 10. So again, we put this in inches. So 240 by 120. Then we need to specify the number of main frames. So MF refers again to main frames. So number of main frames in the consider direction. Since we are looking in the east-west direction, I have two main frames resisting the lateral force in this direction. So one over here at this perimeter and another one over here in this perimeter. So this means we have two. So over here it's already set the value written by default is 2, so I will keep it as it is. For the main frame configuration, the number of stories would be 4. And the number of bays, this here refers to the number of bays of the main frame, not the entire building. So my main frame, the one in red, has 3 bays. So I would put here 3. Again, all this information regarding the basic geometry and things like that, uh, these are important uh, because they are being used in the background to compute the seismic weight and uh, the mass of the building. So you can read more about this in the manual, what is the formulas used to compute that. Now for the GFS or the gravity framing system configuration, th these fields have been deactivated because we didn't consider the gravity framing system, so I, didn't, I don't need here to specify uh, 
this number of columns and so on so this is not important here so now uh, the last thing that we need to define is the building members the sizes of the members and some other geometries so how we do that we do this in an excel file that we need to uh, this is a preformatted excel uh, file that's already provided with frame modeler 2d that you need to fill uh, some sheets inside it with the member sizes and then you browse for it from this interface to import it so I already have here actually on the desktop I have this Excel sheet over here and it's already uh, have been filled so let's go through it quickly so if I open it so again this is the Excel sheet it has a number of uh, uh, so this is the Excel file and it has a number of sheets inside it. Uh, you shouldn't change any of the names of these sheets or uh, any other fields that are protected. The only thing that you will need to fill is the actual values uh, required for your building. So let's go through it quickly. So the first thing, first sheet says W Bay and W Bay meaning the wets the width of the mainframe bay so if you look at our building we have three bays and each bay is 20 feet so this means 20 feet is 240 inches so I go here and I put 240 240 240 because I have only three bays if you make a mistake and you uh, just specify the width for two bays or like four so not three then you will get an error uh, uh, fm2d will tell you that you didn't specify the correct uh, uh, number of uh, fields in the excel sheet and then you can correct it again so that's it this is for the bay uh, for the bay width the second sheet would be the height of the story uh, again we have four stories so I need to define four different heights if you go to the example building again uh, the first story I have here the elevations so the first story is 15 feet the second story is 28 minus 15 which is 13 feet and the other one is 13 and 13 so only the first story is 15 feet and the rest of the stories are typical 13 feet high uh, uh, stories so this is what I do here I do now 15 by 12 so 180 inches and for the other three stories 13 by 12 156 inches so I have already filled these fields but again uh, typically you will fill those uh, yourself but I'm just going quickly through how these values were obtained then we go to the main frame columns so here I need to specify the columns of the main frame and again we have four stories and we have four axes so what are the axes well our building is or our main frame has three bays so this means I have four axes so this is axis number one axis number two axis number three and axis number four so I need to specify the uh, size of or the member uh, cross-section uh, the column member cross-section at each axis of those at each story so this is what I do here uh, so in the first story I have W24 by 130 uh, you need to be careful here with the notation it needs to be written exactly as the notation used in the integrated database in FM2D but you don't need to worry about that because actually at any a cell uh, you can use this list over here so you have this drop down list that you can select from it the name of your section so you have white flange sections European sections so we have a very uh, large library that actually includes more than 700 cross sections i-shaped cross sections that you can select from so you keep selecting uh, all uh, the um, column uh, cross sections uh, notice here that uh, I have here an indication that I have a column splice in the third story so 
the column size was W24 by 103 and then it became W24 by 62 so this means when I go to the third story should you put W24 by 103 or W24 by 62 well the way it works in FM2D you need to put the larger size the one from the story below so before the splice so in story 3 I will specify W24 by 103 okay the next thing that we need to define is the main frame beams again uh, so I have beams at different floors so from floor 2 to floor 5 and I have three bays again so I need to specify the value of uh, the beam cross sections and again those are specified over here w21 by 73 21 by 73 and then the last two floors w21 by 57 so I just select those uh, beam values and put them over here the next sheet is called column splice and this one uh, right now in order for FM2D to know if there are column splice where are they located so you need to specify this using a 0 or 1 so if I have a story that has a splice so then you just need to put uh, this flag ID equal to 1 so this means when FM2D reads this it will understand that at story number 3 there is a column splice 0 means there is none of course you can also have the option to specify the relative location within the height of the building so you can specify that uh, by default it's 0.5 meaning uh, the splice will be located at half or at mid height of the story but if you want to change that uh, like if it's located at one third of the story height from the bottom floor so then you can specify this as 0.133 for instance or 0.2 or 0.25 as you wish so you can control this from the relative location so i will leave it over here at 0.5 at mid height the next two sheets are the gravity framing system columns and beams but uh, these are not important over here because we are not considering the gravity framing system uh, uh, in our model but anyway uh, those are already specified here actually in the elevation so if you want to consider the gravity framing system so you can add these uh, cross sections as I already have it actually over here in this sheet uh, because maybe I can run another iteration uh, of this uh, building with uh, the gravity framing system considered so the same things for the gravity uh, beams you will notice here that you just provide the values at each floor for the beams and at each story for the gravity framing columns you don't have a different axis or a different base because in FM2D I'm as we are assuming that the cross section is constant across all bays which is typically uh, the case more or less and the next sheet is the doubler plate and so as you probably know the doubler plates are uh, plates that uh, as per the size of design you may be required to uh, weld some doubler plates to the column uh, web panel door region in order to make it stiffer so if you design those doubler plates so over here you can specify the thickness uh, the total thickness of the doubler plates at each joint so at each floor and each axis you can put the thickness of the doubler plates of course in this case I'm adding the thickness of the doubler plates in inches so I don't have in the end column I don't have any doubler plates needed but in the interior ones I have some doubler plates welded and here I put the thickness uh, at each joint uh, the last thing is the uh, floor uh, link uh, force profile uh, you don't need to worry about this now because we are not considering uh, a flexible uh, floor uh, link between the gravity framing system and uh, the main frame but you can read more about this in the manual 
and I discussed this a little bit more in the CBF uh, tutorial video. So you can neglect that. The last sheet, this is just the sheet that contains the section database, the one that you were selecting from uh, earlier when we were selecting the beam and column uh, cross sections. So this is just the section database uh, that is being uh, referred to by the other sheets. So that's it. Now we have defined all the information for the member sizes and the basic geometry of our building. So you just uh, close this file, you can save it, and then from the main uh, interface, you just need to browse for the Excel file. So I will click Browse, I go to the desktop, I select the Excel sheet, and then it's, it's telling me, please wait. So give it a few seconds until it re-imports the data and process it. So now it says import successful. This means that you have defined everything uh, correctly. Now I move to the next tab, which is the support and the connections. So here I've been asked some questions about the type of connections. So basically for the mainframe column supports is our mainframe fixed or pinned at the base. So I will use fixed because, again, if I look at my building again, so this has a fixed support here, so I'm assuming fixed. Uh, the mainframe column splice, so these column splices that we indicated, are they pinned? Are they only transferring shear? Or they are they fixed, transferring the moment? So uh, for this example, I will assume that they are fixed, so they are uh, fully rigid splice connections. Then you need to specify the mainframe beam to column connection type. Uh, right now in FM2D, the current version, you have two types of connections. So either a reduced beam section, which is the one that you uh, is illustrated over here, or a welded, bolted, uh, pretty much full section uh, connection. Uh, so I will be choosing actually a reduced beam section, uh, RBS because this is the one that uh, has been used in the design of this example building. And if you select reduce beam section, then you will need to specify these parameters A, B, C that define the geometry of the uh, uh, RBS uh, cut. So by default, these are the values. The values should be like within some range and they are given as like the value of A is a function of the flange width of the beam. The factor B is a function of the depth of the beam and C is a function of the flange width. You can refer to uh, the AISC 358, uh, which is uh, the, the standard for uh, pre-qualified uh, connections. You can see more details about these parameters, but if you have done the design, uh, for sure you know how much are those values. The last thing that we need to specify is the main frame to the equivalent gravity frame link condition. So uh, this is again if you refer to the manual, uh, if I click on this uh, help icon. So again, we have in our model representation, so we have our main frame, which can be CBF or main frame or whatever, or a moment resisting frame. And you have the equivalent gravity frame, which is capturing the P delta uh, loads of the building and uh, can also capture the uh, stiffness and strength of the gravity framing system. So this is pretty much our leaning column. And then you have some links between the two floor links that are truss elements. Uh, and those you can specify as rigid or flexible. So if you choose flexible, then you will need to provide uh, these values like you are assuming that it has like some kind of bilinear response you can specify those values in our case I'm assuming that it's rigid which is actually commonly what we do in numerical models so I assuming that the connection is rigid so I will keep this as it is next for the loads and the materials uh, I have here some actually uh, default loads that are uh, have been already filled 
but uh, basically you need to specify there are three types of loads that are considered in FM2D dead load, live load and cladding load which is the facade, the load on the facade and these are all uniform area loads so they have a units of force per unit area and in our case it's kip per inch square and you can specify different values for the typical or and the roof uh, floors uh, so I'm assuming here actually for the dead load uh, 90 pound per square foot which translates to 6.25 e negative 4 that's why you have this uh, funny number over here this is just after I do the unit transformation but this is basically 90 pound per square foot for the floor live load I'm using 50 pound per square foot for the typical floor and 20 pound per square foot for the roof and for the cladding I'm assuming uh, 20 pound per square foot uh, the next thing is to define the load combination coefficients and again uh, as in FM2D these values will be used to compute the seismic weight basically the loads on the columns and in the building at each floor and it will be used to compute the mass the seismic mass that will uh, trigger the inertia forces under dynamic loading so here I'm selecting the default values but you can modify those so by default um, for the seismic weight I compute it based on a combination that's 1.05 times the dead load 1.05 times the cladding load plus one quarter of 0.25 of the live load for the mass I'm only considering the dead uh, load which is typically what we do uh, for uh, seismic uh, design and seismic analysis so I'm only considering the dead load only so that's why I'm multiplying one factor of one by the dead load and one by the cladding and zero for the life but again you can change those values uh, depending on your preference so these are the default values so I keep those as they are then you need to define the material properties that is the modulus of elasticity and the yield stress Fy and the Poisson ratio mu the units are KSI uh, you have a list of uh, material uh, materials that you can select from European and uh, American and Chinese uh, uh, material types and grades steel material types and grades so you can select from any of those uh, so you have this database already integrated uh, I will select A992 grade 50 so automatically these values have been uh, populated in the fields uh, you can read more in the manual regarding where those parameters or the, where these values came from so I will select A992 grade 50 and then the last thing I will move to uh, the member modeling so under the member modeling tab you are being asked for the main frame column elements how are you going to or how uh, FM2D is going to model these main frame column elements so you have three options so you either model them as elastic beam columns that will have some rotational springs at the ends which is typically what we do or you can model them as fiber uh, based uh, elements displacement based or fiber force based elements so you can uh, select whatever you want for my case here I will use actually elastic beam columns now if you select a fiber uh, based element so you you will be asked as well to uh, consider uh, or to specify some uh, parameters related to the modeling of fiber elements like the number of segments the discretization of the element how many number of segments along the lens uh, how many number of integration points per segment and what would be the global mid length imperfection uh, in the member so these are the default values 85 and 1 over 1000 these are the default values that are used in literature typically but you can change those as well so I will be using elastic beam column 
And notice if you are using an elastic beam column, you will have this last option over here uh, being activated. And this is pretty much it says the main frame column PM interaction. So if you are using an elastic beam column, you have some nonlinear springs at the end of the column. And to characterize the response of these springs, you will need to compute the plastic moment uh, capacity of your column cross section. And this plastic moment capacity, of course, should be reduced based on the gravity load or the axial load P acting on the column. So you are being asked here, how would you like FM2D to compute this axial load? So you can choose two things. You can compute it based on the gravity load. So you compute how much gravity load is acting on the column. And maybe you multiply it by some scale factor. 1, 1 1.5, something like that. And then use this P value in the PM interaction equation to reduce the plastic moment uh, capacity of the column. The other option is to use uh, the maximum push overload. And this is also a typical method that's uh, being used in literature. So what does this mean? What happens is that if you select this option, uh, a preliminary analysis will be conducted, pushover analysis, and then the maximum compression force axial load uh, in the column will be uh, monitored and this maximum uh, compressive axial load uh, in the column under pushover will be used in a combination with the gravity load to compute some kind of average axial load to be uh, expected during dynamic analysis. You can read more about this again uh, in the uh, manual, it's discussed in detail, but for here just to make it simple uh, I will just use uh, scaled gravity load and uh, I will multiply the gravity load by uh, 1.25 because again I would expect that under dynamic analysis you will not only get the gravity load axial load demand from the gravity but you will get some uh, overturning uh, moment which will increase the compressive force on the column so that's why I'm multiplying here but arbitrary value of 1.25 but again this is up to you to choose from so now I'm done with all the building parameters so the next thing that I do is to click submit so now once I do that now the analysis parameter button has been activated and under building parameters it says for story MRF and also this button has been activated here, which says get period. So this one we can click on it and this will run a very quick eigenvalue analysis and it will tell us what the period of this building so far. So if I click on that, So as you see here, you can see here in the command window, you can see the background operations in OpenSeas, that OpenSeas has been run, and you can see the periods over here, but also in the status bar. So now it says that T1 of this building is 1.45 seconds. The mass is 7.3 kip second square per inch, and the seismic weight WS is 3236 kip. So that seems fine. The value seems reasonable. So if you find something suspicious with the period, then this means maybe you have done a mistake when specifying the loads, something with the units, or maybe something with the uh, member cross sections. So this is very useful to check the period uh, upfront before you proceed to the analysis. So now let's go to the final uh, part, which is the analysis parameters. So I click on analysis parameters. So again, uh, I have uh, uh, this module that has a number of uh, uh, tabs. Uh, in particular, it has actually uh, six tabs. So the first tab is the run options. And here you need to specify the type of analysis. So we have a number of analysis procedures that, are cons that you can consider. Pushover, dynamic, incremental dynamic analysis, equivalent lateral force, many things. 
So in this example, I'm going to use uh, incremental dynamic analysis or IDA. So I will select this option. Uh, you can select to show animation. So this will show you an animation of uh, your building, like in Open Seas, while it deforms. Uh, so you let's select that just to visualize this. Of course, this will uh, um, make the runtime a little bit longer, but that's fine just for illustration here. Then you can specify the scaling factor for the deformation. Uh, so I'm using 5 by default, and this is the window size in pixels. Uh, again, I'm using 1000 by 750 by default. Uh, this option, if you want to show the open seas, if you want to show the open seas background operations uh, while it's running, like the conversions uh, iterations and the solution iterations, you can click on that and you will see it here in the command window. But I will not do that, uh, just to keep things uh, clean. Show scope. So if you select this one, this one will show you while the incremental dynamic analysis is being run, you will see uh, a dynamic plot of the IDA curve while it progresses during the analysis. So this is, can be useful because you can see uh, what's happening uh, every increment in the incremental dynamic analysis. Maximum runtime, this is uh, something that uh, you can consider because if in some kind of uh, analysis under some ground, ground motion. Uh, if the open seas solver uh, stalls uh, due to some convergence problem and it goes into an endless loop, so it might be uh, useful to specify some kind of criteria to stop the analysis if it exceeds a certain amount of time. So this is important if you're doing this to run uh, overnight and you don't want to uh, keep it running overnight and the next day you find it that it was stuck in one ground motion. So typically you can put the maximum runtime. So typically this depends on uh, the, the duration of the ground motion, how big is your model, how fast is your PC. But uh, in general, I think like five or 10 minutes per ground motion uh, this is just one intensity of ground motion applied to the building. 10 minutes would be fine because more than that, this means that most likely uh, there is some problem with the conversion. So this is a good, like just a back end uh, uh, control uh, to make a hard stop for the analysis. Uh, the last thing is whether or not to include the modeling uncertainty. uncertainty. So I will not go through this. Uh, this I have discussed in detail in the CBF uh, video tutorial, and it's also discussed in detail uh, in the manual. So I will not consider uh, any modeling uncertainty or Monte Carlo simulation for my analysis. Uh, I will just use the median values of uh, the numerical modeling parameters. So I will not include that. But you can read more about this because it can be very useful if you want to do some kind of sensitivity study, reliability study, or uh, modeling uncertainty uh, type of analysis. So the next step here, push over ELF parameters. Everything is deactivated here because we are not doing a push over analysis or we are not doing an equivalent lateral force analysis. So we don't need to define anything here. Now for the other tab for the dynamic parameters, this is what we are interested in. So the first thing that, so, so the first thing that you need to define here is the intensity measure. So there are two types of intensity measure, the spectral acceleration at first mode period and the average spectral acceleration for a range of periods. Uh, I will use here for simplicity the spectral acceleration at T1. The scaling period, uh, I will specify here the scaling period at 1.45, which is the same as the period, the first mode period of the building. Uh, you can choose here if you want to have adaptive uh, intensity increment. So this means that 
whether uh, you want FM2D to make the increment of the seismic intensity to be adaptive, that it will go smaller once you approach the collapse intensity or not. Uh, just for simplicity, I will not do that. I will just use a constant increment and we, I will use a constant increment of uh, 0.15 G uh, for the, the last things here so these are all the criteria for the collapse point so this is the collapse point tolerance so this is how much accurate you want to get close to the collapse point identification so the tolerance I'm using is 0.05 G uh, you can make it smaller or larger, uh, depending on your preference. A collapse drift limit. So this is a drift limit uh, at which collapse. Uh, this is another criteria that you can add. Typically, the building should collapse under the P-delta load and the deteriorating behavior of its components. But if it reach some kind of drift limit, you can uh, assume that collapse has occurred. occurred. So I'm assuming here it's 15% radian. Uh, this is also another criteria that you can add. So this is the maximum IDA curve slope. So this is the slope of the ID curve because uh, if you are looking at the story drift ratio versus the intensity measure, at one point it goes flat, the IDA curve. So basically you can tell uh, FM2D to stop or to assume collapse if this slope of the curve becomes larger than a specific value. So I can typically you can specify something like 0.5 radian per G, which means that you get an increase of 5% drift, so 5% radian for a 0.1 G increase in intensity. So if you increase the intensity by 0.1 G, you get 5% increase in drift. So if you are getting something higher than that, pretty much you can assume that collapse have occurred. So that's okay. So I will leave those as they are. Uh, then I will go to the damping. So here we again, we are using Rayleigh damping. Uh, and then you need to specify the damping ratio. I will leave it as it is at 2%. And you need to specify the Rayleigh periods. And here I'm using the first mode period and the third mode period. And that's it. And the last thing is, not the last thing, the one before last, is the definition of the ground motions. And the first thing that you need to do is to browse for the ground motion folder. And I already have it here actually in the on the desktop. So this is the one provided by uh, in the supporting documents for FM2D. So this folder contains the individual uh, record uh, acceleration data for each record. So I have here 44 records and I have this text file called allgminfo that pretty much summarizes the name of each record and the delta t for each record that's it so I have this folder ready so I just need to browse for it so I go to the desktop select the folder say select folder you have to wait a few seconds until the data are being imported and organized and checked for errors so now it's done and it turns green and you have here the pass uh, shown here for the ground motion folder so everything is good. Automatically, you have this value has been updated to 44, which is the number of records inside this folder. Uh, for our analysis today, I will not run the full 44 records because this will take some time. I will just uh, run uh, 10 records. So I will run records 1 to 10. You can include free vibration time at the end of each record to let the building come to rest if you are interested in that. Uh, typically, we put like some kind of 5 seconds, 10 seconds of free vibration. Uh, to make things faster in this example, I would put it 0. 
You can also specify the analysis time step as a function of the ground motion delta t. So by default it says 0.5. You can, uh, if you want it uh, more accurate, you can go to 0.25. Actually, uh, in this example, just to make things go faster, I will make it the analysis step the same as the ground motion delta t. Then the last thing that you need to specify is pretty much the records, what kind of data you want to save. Uh, so you have many things that you can save pretty much for all the elements, like things like the story drift ratio, the accelerations, the velocities. Uh, so I will select actually a number of those just to uh, visualize some of these things uh, later on. Uh, I'll put the panel zone, I'll put the floor link, uh, the, and the column element forces and support reactions. You have here this option at the end that says delete output data files after finishing the run. So this is an option that you can consider if you're doing incremental dynamic analysis. So in incremental dynamic analysis, what happens is that uh, once an IDA is finished for a given record, summary data for the IDE curves will be automatically generated in the results folder. But if you don't care about the output data from OpenSeas, you don't need it anymore, so you can select this option to delete the data files after finishing the run. So you can select that if you just want to save some disk space. But for uh, this example, I will just keep it. I will not delete it, actually because maybe we want to visualize this data, which will be the data at collapse point. So now everything is okay, so I will click Submit. So now the Analysis button turns green and it says Dynamic IDA, so this is the type of analysis. And then now we can go ahead and click Run Model the Analysis. So you will observe here that uh, right now you have the uh, window from OpenSeas that shows the deformation profile and analysis uh, running. Uh, in the same time, uh, it says over here, uh, running dynamic analysis in the status bar, ground motion number one at increment number two, scale factor 0.9. And uh, this plot that we see here, this is the dynamic plot, the scope that we selected. So this is showing the IDA curve increments, which is the intensity measure versus the story drift ratio, the maximum story drift ratio, and the peak floor acceleration. So we can see the increments being plotted here at each increment. So this is very good because you can keep track of what's going on. Uh, also in the command window here, uh, you can see also some summary, basically what we are is being plotted in the scope. Uh, over here, it's summarized here, so the number of the ground motion, its name, uh, the last, uh, the current uh, spectral acceleration, the current scale factor, the maximum SDR, the last non-collapse spectral acceleration, and so on. So you can keep track from pretty much all these windows and the status bar, you can keep track of everything going on in the incremental dynamic analysis. Uh, so right now we're still at ground motion number one, increment six, so now we're moving to increment seven, the scaling factor is three. You can see that we didn't reach collapse yet. It seems that the building is now being pushed uh, strongly by the ground motion, so we're close to collapse. So now the story drift, we see that it's getting bigger and the IDA curve, it's going uh, more flat as we approach the collapse intensity. So right now seems that we reached collapse actually. So collapse happened now. So you will see that since collapse happened, uh, right now you see this dashed line over here in the plot, so the dashed red line indicates that 
collapse intensity has been reached. So now actually uh, the program uh, FM2D is trying now to find the collapse intensity. So it keeps iterating to find the collapse intensity. So now it says here collapse range reached, tracing collapse point. So now the program is rolling back with respect to the seismic intensity to find the last non-collapse point using the tolerance and the criteria that we specified. So here you go, now you find another point before collapse, which uh, the story drift ratio at this point is 7%, which is indicated here actually. And then collapse happened again, and I think probably the tolerance has been reached. Not yet, so we're still hunting. So we found another collapse point here, another dashed line has been plotted, so we found another collapse point. So now we're trying to find the last non-collapse intensity, and I think it has been found probably, yeah. So now it has been found, so now the, uh, the algorithm is moving to the next ground motion. So now we are at ground motion number two, it says here, and it says here, increment number two. So again, the same procedure will be repeated for each ground motion record until the 10 records that we are analyzing uh, are finished. So I will uh, try to uh, move forward to skip it like very quickly to the end of the analysis. So now the analysis has concluded and uh, we can go ahead and visualize uh, the results. So uh, uh, just uh, to note here, like for these train ground motions, incremental dynamic analysis, it took uh, about 40 minutes. So that's about four minutes per ground motion, uh, uh, full IDA analysis, which is uh, reasonably uh, fast. Uh, if you go here to check the results folder, you will see that you have 10 individual folders for each ground motion record. If you open one of those records, you will see all the output data uh, recorded by uh, OpenSeas. This is based on what we requested to be recorded. Uh, you will see three uh, text files over here as well. So these uh, ones, uh, they summarize the IDA data uh, for the story drift ratio, SDR, the residual drift ratio, RDR, and the peak floor acceleration, PFA. So for instance, if I open the IDA SDR, this one, you will see here uh, five columns of data. The first column is the spectral acceleration. So you can see here the increments up till the collapse intensity. And the rest of the four columns are for the story drift value in each story. So story one, story two, story three, story four. So this is pretty much what uh, was plotted in the uh, that you can use to plot the IDA curve. So that's fine. We can use this uh, outside of uh, FM2D, or uh, we can visualize actually this data uh, right inside FM2D. So now we can visualize the data by clicking on the visualize button which now became active after 
the conclusion of the analysis. So I will click on visualize. So this is the visualization module and there are many options that we can select from to plot uh, some data. Uh, for sure, since this is an IDA plot, uh, IDA analysis, so we care about IDA plots, basically the IDA curves. So if I select the IDA curve and then I click plot, so you will get three IDA plots. The first one is the IDA plot, this, the intensity measure, which is the spectral acceleration at T1 versus the maximum story drift. And in this plot, you can see there in red line, the median uh, IDA curve. This is the same plot, but for the residual drift ratio. And this is the IDA curves for the peak floor uh, acceleration. Uh, you can also, since this is a IDA analysis again, we are interested in looking at the collapse fragility curve. So we can plot that as well. So if you click on this, you are getting here the collapse intensities for the 10 records. You have the empirical probability distribution and it's being fitted by the log normal CDF. And over here, you have the median collapse intensity 0.71G and the, the standard deviation for the log normal CDF, which is 0.372. Uh, you can also uh, visualize the base shear force versus first story drift for a specific record. So if I select, for instance, record number one, so I will plot here base shear force versus first story drift. This will be based on the uh, uh, last in the collapse intensity or the last non-collapse intensity. So if I click plot. So you can see here, uh, of course, it's uh, this is the normalized base shear force versus the first story drift. Uh, of course, if you, you can see here that the base shear started decreasing under P delta load and all, uh, under deterioration until you reached zero base shear, which uh, indicates a uh, collapse. Uh, you can also visualize the local member response, and this would be the local member response, again, at the collapse intensity, because this is the last set of data uh, that has been recorded by OpenSeas. Uh, so you can select, again, what record do you want to visualize. So, again, let's stay with record number one. And if you click local member response and click plot, So you are going to get this interactive interface where you can select specific uh, elements like uh, the panel zone spring, for instance, and then you can look at the moment, the response of the spring at a given floor or a given axis. Uh, you can look at the floor links or what kind of forces in the floor link. You can visualize the column spring <coughs> rotation <clears throat> the moment rotation uh, of the column springs at any location. So you can go to floor number two, for instance, uh, axis two. Here you go. You can look at the top spring, the bottom spring at the floor, and you can see the moment rotation behavior. So it's very useful to just uh, go around and see all the data. And you can click on save data if you want to save the specific XY data inside one of those plots if you are interested in uh, working with this data externally. Uh, again, you only have here the elements that we saved, that we recorded the data for. So we only have the column spring, the floor link, the panel zone, and the elastic elements. But if you need more, then you can record uh, other elements as well. So this concludes our uh, uh, example tutorial today for moment resisting frames. Uh, thank you for your attention.